All right, well, good evening, guys and gals. Sorry, Rhonda and Bernard, for the technical difficulties. We got a soundboard, um, I'll just say donated. Uh, it's a very nice one. It's very uh, high tech, but we're having some uh, troubles trying to figure out how to uh, make it work. We went from analog to digital. So, uh, uh, but thank you guys for uh, winging it and you know, sometimes those are a little more intimate settings when we just kind of unplug, like I did Saturday when we did our um, uh, New Believers class. You know, I just sit right here, no mic, no nothing, and we just uh, chat together. And so we do this like this on Thursday because this is a little more formal, plus we want to uh, record it for, you know, our YouTube and people who are following along online. But it's nice once in a while to just unplug our small groups. That's what our small groups are on Wednesdays and Mondays. Um, and the women's studies, you know, that's uh, uh, just a good time. But we need to be flexible, right? I mean, that's what Pastor Chuck used to always say. Uh, Blessed are the flexible, because they'll be bent, but they won't be broken. Uh, and if you're not flexible, guess what? You're rigid, and when you get bent, you're going to break. So we need to remain uh, flexible and um, I thank you guys, though, for that, because I know you just got thrown in here, and uh, then the sound not working, and it can be discouraging, but uh, don't be discouraged, right, because anything we do for him, uh, there is a great reward, and uh, I know I was blessed. I saw Coley dancing, so we're, we're in business. God is good, um, but anyways, if you brought your Bible with you here tonight, we are going to study the Word of God. Uh, we're in Numbers 21. But I'm going to actually back up uh, to Numbers 20, uh, starting at verse 23. Uh, just a brief recap on uh, Aaron as uh, we read, and actually we didn't get to talk about it. We just read through it last week because uh, I spent most of the time uh, talking about um, verses 14 to 22. So I want to touch on the death of Aaron, which is really a transition point. Uh, for the nation of Israel, because uh, remember God had told them um, a year or so prior to this that uh, they were not going to enter into the promised land. The generation that didn't trust God, they decided to send spies into the promised land instead of just going in like God said. Uh, the Bible says that they were actually fearful uh, and they were full of unbelief. And so God said, okay, well, because of that now, you, you need to turn back. You're not going to enter into the promised land. You're going to wander uh, back in the wilderness. And so God said that every single one of them, except Caleb and Joshua, were all going to die in the wilderness. All of them, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, all of them except Caleb and Joshua of that generation we're going to die in the wilderness. And so now we saw Miriam already die. And now we're going to see Aaron die. And shortly we're going to see Moses as well. Which when they all died in the wilderness, it was a fulfillment of what God said would happen. A prophecy that God gave. And we know that whenever God says something, we can trust that it's going to come to pass. And so... Kind of a turning point here now is, is that generation is almost done dying. Uh, and then we're going to see in chapter 21 uh, that they're now making advances towards the promised land, but they won't enter until Moses ultimately leans on his staff, a beautiful spot uh, there on the Jordan. We saw it when we were in Israel, beautiful spot where God took him to the mountain and had him look over. And he's still on the Jordanian side of uh, uh, the Jordan River, and just on the other side of the river was the Promised Land. But from that mountain, Mount Nebo was fascinating. I got tons of pictures. I mean, you could see, on a clear day, you could actually see the Mediterranean Sea, which would be on the other side of the mountains of Israel. But Nebo is so high on the Jordanian side, you can see all of the Promised Land, and you can kind of peek and see the Mediterranean Sea. So that's where God took Moses and said, you're not going to enter in because you disobeyed me, you misrepresented me. Remember when he struck the rock a second time and he misrepresented God? God said, you're going to um, suffer the consequences of that, but I will let you see the promised land. And it's a beautiful picture 
Uh, then when Moses leans on his staff, well, then that generation is ready to possess the land. But here we're going to read about them fighting a few battles along the way. God was preparing them for a greater work. And this is kind of what I want us to think about here tonight as we read through this. You know, thank God God doesn't give us more than we can handle, right? God gives us these little battles in increments, he doesn't send us out to be on the front lines and be Green Berets uh, fighting uh, as these warriors. No, He usually gives us these smaller little battles, right? And He begins to train our hand. You know, you think of King David. King David didn't just go out there one day and get a slingshot and kill Goliath. No, David had spent years, years in the wilderness using that sling as a shepherd to do what? Protect the sheep. When the wolf and the bear would come in, David got really good at using that sling on smaller enemies, on less dangerous enemies. Although I would say a bear is a pretty, <laughs> a pretty big enemy. Remember the Bible says that David fought a bear and killed the bear with his bare hands. How do you think David uh, became that kind of a man? Well, it was because David was trained. God trained him through ordinary circumstances. And so the man that we see standing there before Goliath wasn't just some guy who had been sitting on the couch for 40 years, uh, and then all of a sudden this challenge came and he sprung up to his feet and supernaturally God strengthened him and he killed Goliath. Now, God can do that. But 99.9% .9 of the time we see God beginning to work in his servants along the way uh, to get us ready for the next step. So David knew that this Goliath, in fact, that's what David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Why doesn't somebody go over there and shut him up, basically, is what David said. Not because David was so confident in himself. David was confident in the Lord. David was confident that God was going to protect him. Why? Because David had to trust that God was going to protect him in the wilderness. Uh, to fight a bear, you have to have uh, extraordinary courage, or may I say faith, uh, to fight a bear. And so, you know, God tests us, God grows us. Remember, God's tests aren't to see if we're going to pass or fail. Uh, God's tests are to prove us. Remember that. To prove what we are and what we're made of. Uh, there is no failing uh, for the Christian. Everything is a test that is proving who we are. We may have a setback, but that's not who we are. We're going to continue to persevere and endure, and we're going to accomplish all the things that God has for us in our lives. And He's the one who leads us through all these things. And so let's pray here tonight, and we'll get into the study. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to come and to gather. And uh, Lord, I thank you for your word that is here before us. And Lord, that your word is still preserved. What an awesome thing that here in 2024, uh, we can still possess and hold a copy of your word in our hands, Lord. What a testimony that many, many, many thousands and thousands of years, men and women have tried to destroy this word, to remove it from the face of the earth, and yet here it is. Still, I think, one of the top-selling books in uh, the world of all time. It's your Bible, the Word. And so, Father, help us to not neglect such a great gift, Lord, uh, and not to just keep it on the shelf or to only pull it out in emergencies like so many Christians do. We don't open the Word until we really, really need that Word. And yes, God, you are faithful, uh, and sometimes you allow those things to bring us back. But uh, how much sweeter is it when we just give of our time and of our free will and open your word just to have fellowship with you, just to spend time with you and to let your words wash over us and to direct our steps instead of always fighting from a defensive stature where we're always having to come to you in a crisis. Well, we can be proactive and avoid a lot of those crises when we just have fellowship with you, when we're just spending time with you and walking in your ways. Father, our past becomes straight. And then it's a blessing, Lord. It's not a curse that we're always trampling through our sins and our mistakes and the consequences. No, we're able to actually uh, see this true life, this eternal life that has been given to us. And So, Father, bless your word. Bless your people. Uh, we lift up all those who are 
struggling, Lord, physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually, financially, God, that your hand would be upon them, that they would look to you and you would hear their prayers and their cries, Lord, and you would meet them where they're at and you would facilitate all the needs that they have because that's who you are, God. You are Yeshua. You are our salvation. You are our rock. You are our fortress. You are the becoming one, Adonai. You become all things to us, Lord. All that we need, you provide. And so, Father, bless your people and bless your word. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, Numbers chapter 20, again, I'm just going to pick up here at verse 23. That says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron will be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the sons of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Verse 25 Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up to Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar. So Aaron will be gathered to his people and will die there. So Moses did just as the Lord had commanded. And they went up to Mount Hor in the sight of all the congregation. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain when all the congregation saw that Aaron had died. All of the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. And so again, the Bible just says right there that God was basically calling Aaron's number. Uh, Who was it that I was just talking to the other day? You know, we need to remember that. God knows the exact day. God knows exactly the last breath that you and I will take. And, you know, when it's that breath or it's that day, there is no fighting it, right? God uh, knows the days that we have. And so here God says, Aaron is, is ready. It's his day. And so he says, because of Aaron's rebellion against my command, he was not permitted to enter in. Again, one of Aaron's sins that kept him from the promised land was the sin of unbelief because he was part of the group who the council who decided to go against God's will when God said to enter into the promised land. They thought they were wiser than God and they thought it would be smarter to send spies in instead of just trusting God. We went through all of that. But really, when God talks about Aaron's rebelling against God's command, that is one instance But there's another instance when Aaron rebelled against the command of the Lord. Remember in Exodus 32, when Moses was up at Mount Sinai, and he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was uh, receiving the Ten Commandments from God. He was receiving the instructions on how to build the tabernacle. He was beginning to receive instructions about the law and how to deal with your neighbors and property rights and all of these things that we covered. Well, what happened down there at the base camp as Moses was up in Mount Sinai in the presence of God while the people became fearful. See, there's that fear thing again. Uh, You know, the Bible tells us do not fear 365 times. Do you know why God made it clear to repeat that phrase, fear not 365 times? Probably because we need to hear that at least once a day, every year. (laughs) Do not fear. While the people became afraid, they didn't know what happened to Moses. So what did they do? They turned to Aaron. And what did Aaron do? Aaron said, give me all your gold and we'll burn it down and we'll melt it. And Aaron, by his own hands, began to form the golden calf for the people to do what? To worship. Then he promoted some, it sounds like in the context, a sexual mess. uh, And the people were just worshiping this idol. And remember, Moses came down from the mountain and saw what was going on and, you know, threw the Ten Commandments down. He was just frustrated. Here was God's, you know, contract with mankind, right? And they had already broken God's law before God even gave them the law, which again points to you and I being lawbreakers before there was even a law. 
uh, against God and God alone have we sinned. But before God could even give them the law, they already had broken the law. Remember then uh, Moses ground up that uh, golden calf and put it in water and made Aaron and them drink it. Uh, But remember, Aaron led that rebellion against God. There was another time when Miriam, Aaron's sister, and Aaron, remember, rebelled against Moses also. That's when Miriam was struck with leprosy. And so Aaron and Miriam both were, you know, kind of complex characters in the Bible. They were used greatly by God, but then they also had some huge major lapses of faith. And I think there's no accident that we find both of them here uh, dying in the wilderness and not entering into the promised land because you see the deal is the same for you and I. You can do a lot of good things uh, this side of heaven but still not enter into heaven because the only way you're going to enter into heaven is not by doing you know more good things than bad things. Well I did 50 bad things but I did 75 good things so God when I get up there will have the scales of justice right. That's not how it works. There's only one way for us to enter into heaven, and that is by receiving the grace and the mercy of God offered to us through Jesus Christ, that we need to receive God's promise to us through faith. You see, they didn't receive God's promise through faith, right? They had unbelief. They had fear. And so there can be Christians living without faith and unbelief, doing all of these good works. Well, guess what? They may survive in this world, which is what Israel did. They survived for those 40 years. But when it came time and God called their number, they were found to be wanting. They were found to be faithless. They were found to be without a Savior. And they did not enter in to the promised land. You see, the only way you and I can even enter into the promised land, into the presence of the Lord, is the same way they could Through Caleb and Joshua, it was based upon faith, by trusting God and believing God. And so what an amazing thing, though, because they take Aaron now to the top of this mountain. Notice Aaron and his son in verse 25, because remember, Aaron was the very first high priest. God anointed him. God ordained him as the first high priest. And now Aaron was uh, getting ready to die, and so they passed on his office as priest to his son. Notice it says when they stripped him of his clothes. That doesn't mean they, you know, stripped him naked. What did they take off of him? The priestly robes. Remember, he was robed in God's righteousness. He had those robes that God told them how to make them in the certain colors because Aaron was representing more than himself. He was representing a priest of God. And so though the man is found unworthy, Aaron, but yet God ordained him as a priest. And so as a priest, you may say Aaron was found more than worthy. But as a man, he was unworthy. See, that's our same relationship with Jesus. You and I without Jesus are unworthy. That's what the Bible says. For no one is righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what happens when we by faith receive Jesus and repent of our sins? We are what? Born again and we are clothed in whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. So now when we are robed in Jesus' righteousness, we are more than worthy because he is worthy. He has made us worthy. But when we aren't robed in his righteousness, then we are no different than Aaron the man. Aaron the man was found dead there in the wilderness. But yet notice those garments, that office, the priesthood was going to live on. You see, and that's why we have to be careful that we don't get so attached to a person. Uh, Don't get so attached to a a priest or a pastor or a a neighbor who has all the right biblical answers, you know, because here's the reality is that just like here, the office of priest was going to continue. You see, God may take that person that you're clinging to away from you at times. You know, I remember God taught me that lesson here at this church when there was the pastor that was my pastor here. And God began to raise me up, and it took, you know, time and this and that. And 
the pastor would give me opportunities to go with him to different men's studies and things like this. And he asked me to start doing these things. And, uh, you know, it was amazing because I found myself, and it's not wrong, even the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, right? We need to be imitators for other people, uh, good imitators. But I was uh, so encouraged by the pastor and, and, and without even knowing it, you know, I was... I began to be consumed more about seeing him as, you know, the re- not a replacement, but I mean, he, he was the one I began to turn to with all my questions. Instead of picking up the Bible and having these problems and praying, and don't get me wrong, it's not like I wasn't praying, I was praying, but I just needed to hear it from him, right? I needed to hear what he had to say. And, and again, don't get me wrong, that's not necessarily bad, but here's the point, is that what happened when he moved on (laughs) Uh, when he was no longer in my life well who do I have now right well that's why we need to be more dependent upon God because you see people in our lives will come and go and some will stay forever that's wonderful but just like here just because God uproots a pastor God is going to have that office filled Just like here, Aaron's work was done. Whether good or bad, faithful or unfaithful, the office is still held. God's work is going to still continue. That's why in our ministry, you know, we want to always try. We don't have a whole lot of youth here, but we always want to invest in a replacement. You know, I think that's when you become more mature in your faith, when you aren't just looking to... You know, you're looking for what God has called you to do and you want to step out in that, but you also need to be able to reach a point where you're interested in bringing somebody with you. Uh, In my old job, in fact, um, you know, they used to be, the saying was, make sure you train your replacement. And so you say that to somebody and there's one of two ways of looking at this and it's dependent on your character, how you perceive it. When somebody says, train your replacement, some people will say, well, wait a minute. This is my job. I don't want somebody to take my job. I'm not going to train my replacement or I'll train him, but I'm not going to tell him every little thing because then I won't have that edge over him that keeps me above him. That's one way to look at it. I knew a lot of guys like that. They were clinging to that position for dear life. But here's the problem. If you don't train your replacement and you are doing the good job and a right job, then you can't elevate. (laughs) Because then your job is going to be void. And if you're the only one that can do your job, then your boss is going to say, well, guess what? You're stuck there. But you see, when you train your replacement and you invest in your replacement, you want people to be where you're at. You're trying to bring people to your level of expertise. Well, then that's going to offer you to go up. But see, if people are afraid, they won't be elevated. And remember what the Bible says, that it's not man who elevates, it's God. So when we're doing our work as unto the Lord, we're training people to do our jobs. We're training our kids, like I've been sharing on Sunday, you know, with Father's Day. You should want your kids to do better than you. Spiritually, physically, everything, right? I mean, if you don't, I'd like to talk to you after church, right? Because that's your own flesh and blood. I mean, why wouldn't you want your kids to do better than you? You should, right? I have great dreams and hopes for my kids. Not that I'm going to funnel them into my dreams and my hopes, but uh, I want my kids to do better than me, right? And that's not that I did good. And There's a lot of layers of what that means. I don't mean be rich, and I don't mean, you know, have more than I had. No, I want them to take the best of what dad had and cling to that. And some of the things that I'm not the best at, well, they need to do the opposite of what dad did. That's what I did with my relationship with my parents, right? All of the good things, you know, that were biblical, it's amazing. I apply those to my life. And some of the things that I thought they could have done a little different, well, guess what? I have my opportunity now to prove myself when I teach my kids the opposite way. Do the opposite thing. And so, you know, it's amazing. But don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid. You know, if you're clinging to your position and your title and your this, guess what? You're actually trapped. You're actually being possessed by your possessions uh, instead of being free and, and saying, God, you know what? You, you have better for me than this. 
And better comes in many different contexts too, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to make more money or you're going to do this or that. Maybe you're going to have more peace. Uh, maybe you're not always worried about having to... I've seen guys do scandalous things trying to what protect their job, right? Now, I'm not saying, you know, there needs to be wisdom there too, but when you're a good employee... I believe your boss is naturally going to want to bring you further along and give you more stuff to do. Isn't that what the Bible even says? Uh, the one faithful steward, right, who was given a certain amount of talents and he did what? He went out and he used those talents to gather more talents. What did God say? He said, take the talent from the one who didn't do anything and give it to the guy who did it all, right? God is not, you know, blind. Uh, God is going to be, you know, God is very resourceful and uh, God is an amazing manager. But if you are trusting God and, and believing God and doing the right things, uh, then good things will happen. And don't be afraid for people to replace you. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck. Uh, you're going to be stuck. And so Aaron here, they bring him up to the mountain. They strip his clothes off. Remember, it's a picture of his office, the priestly robes, and put them on uh, the sun. And, you know, we need to remember that, that we all have an expiration date, you know, and, and maybe even in ministry, too. You know, God may move us in ministries. You know, we have to be flexible. There needs to be lots of prayer involved. But at the end of the day, wherever God desires you to be, that's where you should want to be because that's where you're going to find your peace and your satisfaction. Uh, being in the center of God's will is going to be the best place for us. And so what happens here, verse 21, or chapter 21, um, we get into <coughs> the first real little uh, battle now for Israel. Aaron has died, Miriam has died, Moses is the only one really left. And so now they're making their way to the promised land. And it's amazing that even on the way to the promised land, they're finding difficulty. They're finding opposition. They're finding battles before they even cross the Jordan. Remember when Joshua leads them into the promised land and what's the first city they came to? Jericho, right? Before Jericho, they had fought many, many battles, right? That's why, again, I say God, you know, God isn't going to just send you out into a fight that you know nothing about. God has to prepare us. And sometimes that preparation takes years. It takes years or decades. Uh, but usually we get very impatient after like 48 hours and we're like, you know, okay, God, you know, it's time. Because we look at things as, well, I only have, what, 20 or 30 years left. So, you know, I better. Do you have 20 or 30 years left? Not if you're a Christian. You have all of eternity. Uh, the work that we're doing now is going to continue in heaven, right? I mean, it's not going to be like this, but serving God and being servants of God is going to continue in heaven. So don't short yourself like thinking, oh my gosh, I only have 20 years left. I better, you know, whoom, hit the pedal hard. Uh, if that is you, I would say you should have hit the pedal a long time ago. So don't stop from hitting the pedal. But guess what? The work is going to continue. Long after we're gone and when we're in eternity, it never ends. And so don't look at things like I only have a certain amount of time. You have all the time uh, in eternity. What we should be doing during that time is spending time fellowshipping with God. In fact, that's what John 17 says, that this is eternal life. What? To know God. John 17, 3 says this is eternal life. To know God. You see, because... We don't want to just wander in the wilderness. Wandering in the wilderness, those people, really it speaks of a wasted life. They, they, yeah, their shoes never wore out. They always ate. God provided for them. God took care of them. But when it came to it, they never entered into the promise. So what's the point? It's wasted. You see, we don't want to waste our life. We want to do what? We want to have fellowship with God. Eternal life actually starts right now. That's what John 17, 3 says. This is eternal life, to know God, right? To trust God now, getting to know God, fellowship, seeing this life as a blessing. God wants us to be a blessing to this world, even though the world is falling apart, it's full of evil, it's, you know, nasty. God still calls us to be a blessing, 
right, to be a blessing to this world. Why? Because a judgment is coming. <laughs> judgment is coming, and God wants to show His glory in and through us despite the evil. But let's read here, chapter 21, verse 1. It says, When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Ish Israel was coming by the way of Athrium, then he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. The Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Hormah. And so again, they're making progress. They're moving now towards the promised land. And what happens? Well, they come to this Canaanite king uh, who sees them coming. And what does he do? He sends troops right away. He sends military right into Israel. And what happened? Well, there was a, a battle, and apparently uh, they were losing the battle, Israel. Some of their people even got captured, right? Which, this is their first real fight. This is the first real fight of this new generation that was going to inherit the promised land. This is their fight. And, and did they prevail immediately? No. In fact, they were suffering a defeat. People were being taken captive. And so the Bible says the people began to do what? To cry out to God. And listen to this. They actually made a vow. And what was their vow? They said, God, if you give us victory here uh, over these people, then what will we do? We will destroy their cities. I find this amazing to me. First of all, that they would uh, think to make a vow. Now, the Bible tells us that we shouldn't make vows. The Bible says that we should uh, let our yes be yes and our no be no. Anything beyond that, you know, usually when people have to make vows, there's kind of a level of uncertainty. That's why they have to make the vow. Or may even say when somebody's lying, right? When somebody always says, well, let me tell you the truth. It's like, well, what have you been telling me? The non-truth? Why do you have to say, let me tell you the truth? You should always be saying the truth. So the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But, if you are going to make a vow to God, I will say this. You need to be understanding that God expects you to keep your vow. That's why he says don't make a vow. <laughs> because God expects you to keep that vow. And there can be consequences when the vow is not kept. We see that again and again and again. So it's better to not make a vow. It's better to just do the right thing. It's better to just, when God prompts us to do what God is prom prompting us to do, instead of you know, negotiating with God, be careful. Right? Because uh, God's going to expect us to do our part. So listen to what their vow is, though. I think there's some great insight into this. Because think about this. Usually in these days, an army that conquered another army would raid all of their booty. Right? Would take all of their gold, all of their horses, all of their right. I mean, they, they conquered them, so they're going to take all the resources. Remember, Saul even got in trouble for that the first king of Israel, when God said, when you, I give you victory, you destroy all of the people and burn all of their stuff and bring the gold into the treasury of the Lord, into the house of the Lord. Well, remember Saul says, well, you know, all those sheep over there, you know, we could use the wool, we could use the meat. So what did he do? He took some of the spoil to himself. Did God take notice of that? You bet he did. So here, what an interesting thing, because look at this picture. They say, God, if you give us victory, we will burn this whole city. What are they saying? They're saying, look, God, we're not in this for our profit. We're not in this for our profit. We're in this for your glory. So when all of their possessions are captive, we're going to burn them. In other words, we're going to burn them as a sweet, savoring aroma to you. What a fascinating, fascinating thing. Why? Because they didn't want any profit from it. They wanted their fighting to be done for the glory of the Lord. Right? What an amazing thing to me that is. And so 2 Corinthians says this, guys, when it comes to our battles, because they entered this battle and they were more faithful than the other generation. 
Remember, this is one of the reasons why the other generation said, we're not going to enter in because the report of the spies was, oh my gosh, they're giants. They're huge. You know, their armies are great. We're never going to be able to defeat them. Well, these guys had the courage to enter in by faith and even to engage in battle and to even suffer losses. And they still made a vow to God. Why? Well, their hearts were right. They weren't in it for the profit. They weren't in it seeking the glory of men and to be conquerors over these people. No, they were trusting God. And what happened? God gave them the victory. God gave them the victory. We need to remember that, guys, that ultimately the battles that we fought have already been won. They've already been won. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We may lose a few fights, but what happens in a war? There's a battle that is won. You may lose a few fights, but overall, the battle has been won. Our battle has been won, right? What an amazing thing. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 14. Paul says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death. To another an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. What did he just say there? Christ always, underline that word. It's okay to write in your Bible. He always leads us in triumph in Christ. Why? Because he has already conquered. Remember, where is Jesus sitting? Is he in sitting on one of the little scales of the balance of justice and Satan's on the other one and God's in the middle waiting to see who's going to win? No. Christ is victorious. When he rose from the grave, the Bible says he conquered death, he conquered sin, he conquered the devil. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is a conquering king. Now the enemy's tools in his little war that is still going on our tools of fear, our tools of discouragement, right? Christians who are already more than conquerors, uh, those who are being led triumphantly in Christ are being discouraged by the enemy and setting themselves on the sidelines. It's not God who sits us on the sidelines. It's ourselves. It's our lack of faith. It's our unbelief. It's our fear. It's these bodies. It's sin, Right? It's the temptations, it's the sensuality, it's the lust of the heart, the lust of the mind, uh, the pro- boastful pride of life. It's these things that do what? Slow us down. That's why Paul says in this race that we should throw off those things that are slowing us down. We shouldn't allow anything to impede us. Why? Because we are more than conquerors. We are already victorious but too many Christians are over there becoming stagnant because they're either discouraged or they're uh, flirting with sin or they're full of fear or, you know, they've replaced, they're doing some idol worship, right? I worship God and he's one of my many gods, right? It's just sometimes I have to call more on that God. It's like, you know, God is jealous. God is jealous. He's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. He doesn't want to share us with another false god. Uh, He wants all of us. And so remember that. He always leads us in triumph. And yet, what do we see? Christians walking around in defeat, right? Well, you're not defeated. You've defeated yourself. Uh, You need to continue to trust Jesus and to walk in the light. Galatians 1.10 says this, He says, uh, Paul, again, he says, uh, let me find it here. I think I had it marked. Galatians 1, uh, 10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ Jesus. You can't serve and want to be men pleasers and God pleasers at the same time. You can't. And may I say, sometimes when we're being pleasing to God, we're not going to be pleasing to people. 
Not all people. What did that last scripture in 1 Corinthians say? To those who are being saved, it's a, we're a sweet savoring aroma. But remember, to those who are perishing, to those who are rejecting Christ, to those who are clinging to this life, we are a stench of death, right? We are a stench of death. And you know that. When you walk into a room and you can sense the darkness and you walk in, <laughs> how you could just feel like everyone's like, oh, he's the Christian, you know. Why? Well, because you are an aroma. You are putting off an aroma. And to those who are being saved, it's a sweet savoring aroma. But to those who are perishing, you are a reminder of death. You are a stench of death. You are a reality to them. You know, it's like the demons. When Jesus came uh, to cast out the demons, what did the demons say to Jesus? What do you have to do with us? It's not your time yet, right? The demons knew that their time was short. The demons knew their end. Well, those who are given to death know that their time is coming, right? Just like the Christians, we know and we look forward to our time of coming. Why? Because our uh, coming is into eternal life, right? It's to be in the presence of God. Well, think about the opposite of that. Those who are in darkness who know that they are set for destruction, right? That's why you are a stench of death to them, right? And the sad thing is, is that people who are in that condition, if all they had to do was turn to Jesus, right? Though they are on this road and they may feel like they're seared, I've met them. I've met people who said, no, I'm damned, you know? And I'm like, no, you're not. If you're still breathing, you're not damned. Why? Because the only unpardonable sin is what? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or rejection of Jesus Christ. So I said, all you have to do is cry out to him right now and any dark force that has you bound will flee. I've seen it again and again and again. But what do they say? No, it's just not true. Or, you know, whatever their, you know, response is, but it's, it's not based in truth. The truth is, is that God doesn't damn anyone. It's men who reject God who have damned themselves. Weren't we reading that in the Gospel of John? Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Those men who are condemned have condemned themselves by what? By not believing in Jesus Christ. And so remember that, guys. As we're out there, nobody is outside the reach of God. Nobody. Nobody. If they're breathing, they are not outside the reach of God. Right? God maybe calling you and I to be the ones, you know, what was that guy? Well, there's been a lot of them. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times God loves to save people who have huge platforms. Um, several of them. Some old rock and roll, you know, guys who had millions and millions and millions of fans who all of a sudden become Christian. You know, what, what, a, what a testimony, right? When they out there come out there and everyone knows their life and then they come and they're, now I'm talking about sold out Christians, right? Not just people who all of a sudden say, you know, they're Christian and then they keep doing all the same garbage they're doing and trying to reach a broader audience too, right? Let's bring the Christians into my, you know, Facebook page too. No, those who become sold out for Jesus, what an impact they have, right? What an impact to the world they have, you know? And so don't, you know, look at the dirtiest, darkest. Now, use wisdom, use discernment. Don't just go in there solo and think, you know, God's calling you to. No, but don't be afraid to pray for that person. Don't be afraid to even go a step further, right? The, the sometimes, look at the demoniac. Perfect example, right? This guy was so ruthless and heinous and, and he was cutting himself and the town was so afraid of him, they chained him, right? Because they were afraid he would like, come and hurt the women and the children, and so they chained him, right? Well, what happened when he came into contact with Jesus? Jesus cast out those, what, legion, thousand demons, possibly, set him free, he was in his right mind. The next time the people saw him, he was clothed, he was just like them. Wow, what do you do with that? What do those people do with that? They say, this guy was crazy, we were afraid of him chaining him, now, now look at him. What changed? <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Jesus set him free. What a tremendous testimony for the rest of that guy's life. Imagine the parents telling the kids, the kids telling the grandkids, the grandkids telling the great grandkids the story of Legion. You see, that's the business God is in. 
God is in that business. You know, Jesus even said, you know, the sick people are the ones who need the doctor. Those who aren't sick, they don't need a doctor, right? Those who got this life figured out and their pockets are full and they're just happy as a clam, they don't need a savior, right? If they need a savior, they just go buy a savior or they, you know, find another savior. But those who are sick, those who have been backed into a corner, those who have lost everything, those who still haven't found what they've been looking for, oh, they're sick and oh, they need a doctor, don't they? They're looking for help. They're asking for help. They're crying out for help. And those are the ones that we see that come to Christ. The ones who are sick. It's just like here. We're not going to cover it because it's a repeat of when we were in Exodus. Because right after this battle, God finally gives them the victory. And then they have to go the long way around, remember? Because the, the other group didn't let them pass. We read about that last week. And so what happened? They went from this great victory and they were on fire and they're singing psalms and hymns and then God redirects their path and what happens? They become discouraged. But God, we want the easy way. We don't want to go the hard way, right? I talk like that because that's usually me, you know, whining. God, does it have to be this hard? Can't it just be easy? God took them a difficult way and the Bible says they became discouraged see guys we need to remember in this battle we're going to have great moments you know to me there's nothing better i said this on monday and i posted something on facebook about it as a pastor there's no greater joy to me than hearing somebody taking something that they heard or something that they read in their bible and making it their own and seeing it as something that god spoke to them not me or not you know somebody else and grabbing a hold of that and letting that word change their life. Guys, that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's the only reason why I'm here. Because that word got a hold of me. Because I got a hold of that word. And that word began to change me. And so I know there's power in that word. And so when I see other people grabbing onto that word and letting that word change them, then I know that, boy, they better buckle their seatbelts because that road is going to be intense. That road is going to be full of highs and it's going to be full of lows. Full of lows too. We don't like to talk about the lows, but let me tell you, there's a lot of lows in ministry too. Just in being a Christian, there's a lot of lows. But the key is, is to not be discouraged in these lows. You see, God redirected this group and they became discouraged so God had to send a test didn't he and the test was he sent fiery serpents into the camp to bite them and when they got bit they were dying you think well how mean of God was that no the people were not trusting God they were becoming discouraged they were grumbling against God's perfect will so what did God do well he told Moses that's the part we read in Exodus when he formed the serpent on the staff the bronze serpent and he said whoever has been bitten, if you look upon this serpent, the minute you look upon the serpent, you will be healed, you will be saved. Beautiful picture of Jesus, right? We talked about all that. They had to look to Jesus again. Those who were looking away, who were looking at their circumstances, who were being discouraged and they were getting bit, right? The wages of sin is death. When we don't trust God, when we're not walking in faith, we're walking in fear, right? There's the compare contrast. You can't be full of fear and walking in faith. You can't. And so the picture was they were walking in fear, discouragement, and this and that. But the minute they looked back to Jesus, the minute they looked to God, God saved them. And so I'll say this about discouragement because we can all be discouraged. Their discouragement here, there was a good reason for them to be discouraged. Let's look at this logically. Let's not just live in the clouds and act like nothing bad happens. No, it happened. They had to go a hard way, a long way. Who, who's raising their hand going, woo give me the hard way. Unless you're, you know, twisted like that. So it's safe to say their discouragement, there was a good reason for them to be discouraged. But here's the key. It's still not an excuse to walk in discouragement. You have reason to be discouraged because things got ruffled up. But now, 
How are you going to respond to that? Are you going to now walk in discouragement? Are you going to use that? Because let me tell you, that's not an excuse. No, God wants us to do what? To examine the discouragement and to keep pressing forward. Keep trusting God. Keep trusting God. Is God faithful or not? Did God get us this far? Well, then who's to say God isn't going to continue? Doesn't the Bible say he who began this good work? Who is it? It's he who's faithful to complete it. He doesn't tell us the the ins and the outs all the time. He tells us to walk by faith. So this discouragement, it's okay to be discouraged for a moment. But we can't walk in discouragement. We can't let that derail us from what God is calling us to do. Kind of like tonight. Sound problems. Well, what are they going to do? Forget it. We're not doing it Sunday. Can't walk in that discouragement. Right? The pastor. I mean, it goes on and on and on. You can't live in that discouragement. It's not an excuse. We keep pushing on. In fact, this is where we close. Somebody needs to hear this tonight and somebody needs to meditate upon this tonight. Because Paul, if anyone, knew about discouragement. How many times was the guy shipwrecked? And yet he still got on ships. You would say, whoa, what a fool. He's not wise. You know, the ship crashed. You know, you shouldn't get on another one. Hmm. Paul's trust was not in the builders of the ship. Paul's trust was in the Lord. If God was calling him to go, Paul was going to go. Didn't God use Paul in the shipwreck? Didn't Paul be used when everyone was throwing in their hands in the air and they were praying to all their other gods and they thought they were dying? God actually used Paul in this tragedy to bring peace to the boat. What an amazing thing. And the boat still crashed and shipwrecked, but guess what? Everyone was saved. Why? Because God told Paul, let the people know not one of you is going to be lost. So the people cling to those words of Paul. And guess what? Paul didn't have the power to save them, but Paul knew the God who did. And so not one of them perished. Imagine the testimony from those people who lived and went back on to sea and went home and told their families. See how God, I mean, God is just awesome. But what if Paul got in a little shipwreck before and then God called him to get on a ship and go somewhere else and Paul said, no, look, I already learned you know, my lesson. I'm not going to get on another ship. Well, be careful. Sometimes God takes us back to those places of failure to do what? To, to pass us on, right? We are what? Always walking in triumph in Christ. These setbacks aren't meaning that we're not triumphant God has reasons and purposes for the setback. Maybe it's to have somebody saved. Joseph was thrown in prison. Was that triumphant? Not at the moment. In Joseph's eyes. But what happened? God used Joseph, didn't he? What about Paul and Silas when they were in prison? Were they triumphant in prison, being chained in a dark cellar? Well, they were triumphant because what were they singing? They were singing praise to God. The guys next to them must have thought, these guys are cuckoo. (laughs) You're about to die. You're about to go to the gallows. It's dark. We're chained. Why are you so happy? Well, they weren't happy, were they? They were full of joy. Why? Because they knew. They had fellowship with God. They were triumphant. It didn't matter if it was in death or life. They were triumphant. And God had a reason for them to be in that prison, didn't he? Didn't the jailer get saved? Didn't his whole family get saved? Who one by one, all of them went back and had families later and spread those stories? I mean, see how the God is just awesome, guys. But if we're not fellowshipping with him, if we're not walking by faith, if we're not stepping out, if we're not uh, going and praying for the hard cases and, and, and these sorts of things, if we're not seeing ourselves as triumphant or conquerors, we could be missing opportunities. And guess what? God's not going to suffer for that. Just like Aaron, God will bring somebody else to do the work. God's work is going to be done one way or the other. It's you and I who miss out. It's you and I who miss out. And I don't know about you, but I missed out on a lot of things. I don't want to miss out on things anymore. 
I'm actually willing to now take steps in faith. And guess what? Maybe those things don't always pan out the way that I want. But you know what I always fall back on? God, this is something that I didn't want to do. (laughs) This is something that you've called me to do. This is something that I'm trusting you to do. You can't get any more safe than that. Right? In anything we do. God, your word says this is what I should do. So, you know, it'd probably be easier for me to do something else, but I'm going to trust you with this. There's no better place to be in that, guys. There's no better place to be because then at the end of the day, we can turn back and throw it on God. Right? That's okay. God, this is what you had me to do. And I did it to the best of my ability. God sees that. And God will continue to grow us through those things. So remember that we have reasons at times to be discouraged, but we have no excuses for discouragement, to live in discouragement. But look at this. Paul says this in Philippians 3, verse 12. This is the scripture I said somebody needed to meditate on tonight. Paul says, Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul says, I haven't gotten there yet, guys. I haven't obtained what it is that God has obtained me for. You think of all the things God used Paul to do. And Paul still had this attitude If I haven't gotten there yet, guys, there's still work to do is what Paul's saying. I'm in perfect peace with God, but I know that there's still more for me to do. And so he says, what? I press on. I don't become discouraged. Uh, I don't get tangled up in sin. I keep my vessel pure so that I can be effective for God and his kingdom. And I press on when snags happen, when wars happen. I'm victorious in Christ more than a conqueror. I keep pressing on. And notice he says that he may lay hold of that which he was laid hold of. What does that mean? It means that God laid hold of him. Remember, Paul was Saul. And Saul was a very righteous zealot, right? Religious guy, very right. In fact, he said of himself that... uh, Considering the law, he was righteous. He was blameless. Paul was, a, in his mind, a perfect guy. And that zeal led him to the place where once this church stuff started popping off, that Saul thought it was his religious duty to go out there and kill those Christians. So he was on his high horse riding out to where? Antioch, I think it was. He was going through Damascus, but I think he was on his way to Antioch. But it was going through Damascus that what happened? He was laid hold of. (laughs) God grabbed hold of him, didn't he? God knocked him off that horse. God blinded him. God spoke to him. God called him. God laid hold of Paul. Has God laid hold of you? Has God gotten a hold of you? You were always this free running around cannon and this and that. Well, has God ever laid hold of you? Has God wrapped his arms around you and spoke words to you that no man or woman has ever spoken to you? Has God laid hold of you? If he hasn't, ask him here tonight. God, lay hold of me. And when God lays hold of you, guess what? Then you're going to be able to press on to what that which he has laid hold of you for. Meaning he's not going to just lay hold of you and stick you up on the shelf and say, wait there for 40 years until I come back to get you. No, he's going to lay hold of you because he wants to, what? To send you out to accomplish all the plans and purposes that he laid hold of you for. You see, we can't just think selfishly all the time and think, well, God just wants to take care of me and pamper me and do all these things to me. God blesses us, don't get me wrong. But God lays hold of us to accomplish His works. His works aren't to just make the church so rich and, you know, beautiful and sinless that everyone goes, wow, I want to 
want to be a Christian. No. God sends us to the sewers. God sends us to, the, to Mexico. God sends us to a dead, dying world to do what? To minister the gospel to them. Right? To care about people. God cares about people. So Christians should care about people. You know that's the primary business God is in? People. <laughs> because in the end, that's what it comes down to. Every life that was created will stand before their maker. What position do you want to see people standing before God in? Well, I've tasted and seen that God is true, that God is faithful, that God is good. And all I want to do, and I've devoted the later half of my life to doing it, sharing that hope with other people. I want other people to experience a taste of God. That's why I study this Bible. That's why I uh, stand before you guys. So that we all can taste and see. And you know what? Maybe you just got a little nibble. Guess what? A nibble is still enough. Take another nibble. Take another nibble. Then it'll be a bite. Then it'll be the whole thing, right? The point is, is like Paul said, you're never going to obtain it, but you're going to continue to pursue it. That's a safe place to be because remember in a battle, a conquering army is always moving forward, aren't they? Conquering army, you know, you start standing still, you're actually losing ground. Though you haven't started retreating, you're standing still, you're, you're losing ground. We need to keep pressing forward, keep moving forward. Because the minute you stand still, that doesn't mean we need to go, 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 go. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating, don't sleep, don't rest, just, you know, pursue it. No. I'm saying that this faith that we continue to step out in, these good deeds, these good things, prayer, studying the Word of God, fellowshipping with God, we need to continue to press into those things. These battles, we need to continue to persevere, to endure. And God is faithful, guys. God is faithful. Let God lay hold of us that we may know what He's laid hold of us for. There's nothing greater to see when the light bulb starts going on in our heads. We begin to see a vision. God gives us a vision. God gives us plans and purposes. And we just be busy about His business. That's all that He's asking us to do. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When we stand before Him, all we're going to hear is what? Well done, good and faithful. Well done, good and faithful. That's all God wants us to do is be faithful to Him. And whatever it is and everything that He's asking us to do, just trust Him. This is life that we would know God. That is eternal life, knowing God. Let's pray here tonight. Father in heaven, I just I thank You, Lord, for Your Word tonight. And thank You for the truth of Your Word that sometimes God is, is all we really need to hear. And so, Father, I pray that as Your Word has been shared here tonight, that each and every one of us would take a piece of it, Lord. Take a little bite that is sweet, Father. And I pray that first it would give us a greater hunger for more, that we would keep coming back to Your Word. And we would take more and more, because I believe the more we take of You, the more we become like You. <laughs> it's not some miracle potion where I need to say this certain prayer and I'm going to be just like Jesus. No, it's taking His Word bit by bit and, and feeding our souls with it. The more we know you, the more we become like you. It's, it's pretty simple yet very complex. The more we decrease, the more you increase in us. The more we walk in the Spirit, the less we walk in the flesh. The more time we give to you, Lord, the more time you give us. And so, Father, bless your people. Bless your church. Thank you again for Rhonda, Bernard, Lord. What a blessing, God. I thank you for Toby, and I thank you for Brent, Lord, and, and all of us just trying to, just to do a little part, God, to be a piece of this little work, Lord. And I just pray that we're continuing to promote you, Jesus, and to lift you up and, 
uh, not to be ashamed, not to be shy, uh, to reach out to uh, the people in the community, to be your hands, to be your feet. Lord, just keep us sensitive to the work that you are calling us to do each and every day. And let those days start by spending time with you. I find my days are so much more useful when I just start with some of your word to meditate upon. How my perspective changes. Sometimes the direction even changes. The conversations change. The outcome changes. It's amazing. And so, Father, have your way with us, I pray. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.